So I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, something that urologists don't talk about often, which is uh, integrating radiation in the armamentarium of uh, muscle and vasal bladder cancer. So as you know, there's going to be a, a growing uh, aging population. Uh, the largest growth is expected to be in the uh, eighth decade, and that's the decade where bladder cancer peaks. So over the next uh, two, three decades, I suspect there's going to be the largest growth of bladder cancer patients, particularly in the octogenarian population. As we know that the radical stectomy and perioperative chemotherapy remains the standard of care in muscle and bladder cancer, and uh, trimodality therapy has been slowly but uh, steadily gaining uh, widespread acceptance as an alternative uh, treatment approach. A couple things, uh, chronolog chronological age alone should not be used to exclude patients from either radical stectomy or other forms of definitive uh, therapy. Appropriate treatment decisions should incorporate not just age, but functional status and comorbidities, patient desires and goals, and an informed understanding of the risks and benefits. And lastly, if you look at most bladder cancer literature, most of that literature focused really on just cancer-specific survival, or overall survival, providing absolutely no information about quality of life and function, particularly in muscle invasive bladder cancer patients. Invasive disease in the elderly, uh, is it indolent? There has been earlier studies showing potentially that the invasive disease could be less aggressive in bladder cancer, but actually, if you stratify it by age, uh, octogenarians still have a significant risk of non organ confined disease, 50%, and a 20% risk of no positive disease. So the aggressivity of this disease is the same regardless of age. Consensus for most series is that radical stectomy can be performed safely in the elderly, preferably at high volume centers. And while the risk for radical stectomy related deaths may be higher in the elderly, the risk of complications is more influenced by medical conditions rather than chronological age alone. So several studies have looked at cancer-specific survival in octogenarians, and they've all been consistently showing decreased survival in this patient population. Several reasons that could be attributed to that. Number one, delays in performing surgical interventions. One tend to delay radical surgery uh, much more often when we're dealing with the elderly population. Potentially optimizing a medical condition can take a longer time than the younger patient population. There's definitely a lower likelihood to receive perioperative chemotherapy. Now, whether this, whether this is because of perceived impression of higher complication rates, slow recovery from surgery, increased comorbidities that may discourage that uh, uh, adjunctive therapy. And keep in mind that the majority of patients in their 80s will not have an EGFR sufficient enough for platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. And lastly, several studies looked at the performance of lymphadenectomy in, this, uh, in patients with muscle vase disease, showing that there is significantly less uh, incidence of uh, lymphadenectomy performed in patients who are older. And the thought probably is, got to get this patient up out of the OR as quickly as possible to minimize morbidity. But the other side of the coin is, you may argue that in this patient population where they're not going to receive any form of chemotherapy because of the fu kidney function, maybe in a surgical uh, quality with extended lifting may play a much higher role in this patient population. Radical stectomy is not a walk uh, in a park. It's uh, fraught with complications. 64% with complications within 90 days as the experience from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Mind you, the majority of which are clavian grade 1 and 2. And I would argue that the rate of complications, particularly late complications, is much, much underestimated for radical stectomy, as most studies looked at the absolute number of complications over the total number of patients without any time dependency factor. And as you know, the majority of patients, 50%, will die early on with radical stectomy, and the late complication factor will not be captured. What's happening in Quebec? Mortality by age. It's clear that as patients get older, the periarbital mortality from the procedure itself increases significantly. This is an updated analysis from, uh, from Zachary, as a fellow who's working with Armory Preken, uh, looking at the 90-day mortality uh, stratified by age. This is a population-based study in Quebec uh, over the last decade. The mortality in the octogenarian population, 90-day mortality is 13%, which is very uh, significant. <coughs> SEER database, 10%, 90-day mortality, 
And even when we're looking at academic centers alone, if you look at the bladder cancer network experience, the 90-day mortality is still significant at 8% from the procedure alone. So I've showed the slide yesterday. If you look at the trajectory of patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer, as you said, as we said, the standard will be a cystectomy, and appropriately selected patients may undergo trimodality therapy. But what percentage of patients never receive any definitive therapy whatsoever? Several studies have looked at that. This is a paper from the GNCI back in 2010 that captured patients from the SEER database with muscle invasive bladder cancer. And what it showed is patients in their 80s, 60% of those patients never receive any form of definitive therapy, which is unacceptable. Another database, the National Cancer uh, Database from the States, again, patients in the 80s, the majority of those patients do not receive any form of definitive therapy. Alarming. What's happening in Canada? There's no data to, uh, to, uh, to, to directly capture this, but speaking to Chris Booth and looking at an indirect correlate, so the percentage of patients that die of bladder cancer that never receive any form of definitive therapy to the bladder, 61% of those patients who die of bladder cancer in Ontario never receive any form of definitive therapy to the bladder. If you think that 20, 25% may be the novel metastatic disease, that still leaves a significant number of patients even with non-metastatic disease that develop metastasis that never receive any definitive therapy. And I would argue that the, the reason for this is, is probably our fault. The urology community have not embraced trimodality therapy as a treatment strategy, particularly in patients who are actually not fit for surgery. They're often left with repeat UR, repeat UR, repeat UR without any form of consolidation with radiation. Radiation, as you know, has been a standard in many organ systems, cancer systems. And uh, for bladder, the results have been uh, not, not too bad. Although the follow-up is limited, the results are pretty good. Uh, patients can be cured. The uh, local control is good with a reasonable quality of life. So let's go over the data. Now, when I talk about trimodality therapy, it's TUR, radiation, and chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy we're talking about is not the full dose systemic chemotherapy when we're thinking about the new adjunct setting. It's actually the chemotherapy, it's a chemosensitizer, which is much, much better tolerated than the full dose chemotherapy. <clears throat> I would say the three pioneers um, with regards to trimodality therapy have stemmed from uh, three centers, the University of Erlangen, Paris, and the Boston Group at MGH. The approaches are, are varied. Uh, most, most people use the full uh, radiation with chemotherapy approach and reassessment of response after. The uh, Boston group have popularized the initial induction radiation with chemotherapy with an early assessment of response. And if there is a good response, meaning CR, then they get the full dose after. At McGill, we've used the complete dose from the get-go just to optimize the CR and uh, minimize the uh, patients undergoing salvage cystectomy. Outcomes, University of Erlangen, 415 patients, published in JCO back roughly 10 years ago. Five years disease physical survival, 56%. 80% of survivals retain their bladder. Of note, in their, in their series, 22% of those the patients have clinical T1 disease. The factors responsible and associated with response was stage, complete visible TUR, and the adding of chemotherapy to radiation in the series. Updated analysis, CRs of 88%. Mind you, this analysis incorporated half the spatial population with clinical T1. Paris, 120 patients, five-year disease-specific survival, 51%. The initial CR is 77%. And lastly, I would say that's probably the most kind of robust data uh, on trimodality, looking at the experience from uh, the MGH. This is cumulative clinical trial experience of 350 patients. The follow-up is reasonable. Actually, that's one of the longest follow-ups among the trimodality literature. Most, liter most uh, follow-ups in trimodality therapy patients are, have less than five-year follow-up. Follow-up, 7.7 .7 years. The disease-specific survival, 64%. And when you're counseling patients, this is, the number, this is the number actually that you quote, somewhere between 25 and 30% will, some, will undergo a salvage radical stectomy in the future. Is there evidence that chemotherapy increased overall survival of tumor control and bladder conservation? Initially, University of Langer looked at that, but based on retrospective data, evaluating the CRs 
uh, when you compare RT alone, RT with carbo, RT with cisplatinum, or RT with 5 few cisplatinum. And basically, the integration of chemotherapy, particularly cisplatinum, has been shown to significantly improve <coughs> CRs in the University of Erlangen <coughs> experience. The first randomized trial that looked at that is actually from the NCIC back in 1996 that evaluated the addition of cisplatinum in patients either undergoing definitive radiation or cystectomy. And they show a signal of improved progression-free survival in the spatial population, no difference in overall survival. And more recently, as you're aware of, Nick James' trial from the UK randomized 360 patients receiving radiation therapy alone versus radiation with 5-FU mitomycin, which is attractive in the sense that patients who have a low EGFR can still get this kind of regimen uh, as opposed to cisplatinum. <coughs> In their study, uh, they put this question to rest. There was significant improvement in uh, progression and region, local regional control rates uh, in patients receiving chemo radiation therapy versus radiation alone. Five-year overall survival in this study was 48%. Role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in patients treated with trimodality therapy. If you look at the, the NGH experience, uh, the trials that evaluated that, mind you, they're all small, small sample size. They never showed a difference or a benefit on the agile chemotherapy when we're using trimodality therapy. The curves completely overlap. The MRC study that evaluated the neoadjuvant chemotherapy with radiation, it evaluated with radiation alone. So it was not, it was not with trimodality therapy. And in that trial, if you look at the subgroup analysis, neoadjuvant chemotherapy trended towards significance with a p-value of 0.06. Meta-analysis did not show any uh, impact on neoadjuvant mm -hmm. chemotherapy at this present time when we're giving trimodality therapy. So the question requires further evaluation. So this, this, this table, you can probably, you know, different numbers depending on who's presenting the stock, you know. You can pick and choose which trials to show that either the trimodality therapy is similar to survival to radical stectomy or inferior. What I would argue is, you know, looking at the data in detail, trimodality therapy probably has a bit inferior survival than radical stectomy, but nevertheless, it's still effective. Often people quote the SWOC study as, uh, <laughs> uh, as, uh, as the trial showing that radical stectomy survival is similar to trimodality therapy. But I would argue in the SWOG study, two-thirds of the spatial population has clinical T3B, T4 disease, which is a high-risk patient population. And I would argue that if this is the, tr this is the, um, the slide I showed yesterday for looking at neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but I'm showing it for maybe uh, discussing the, the, the benchmark uh, where you should set radical stectomy outcomes to be when you compare it to trimodality therapy. If you look at trimodality patient population, they're usually selected to have no hydronephrosis, no palpable mass, no high-risk features. So maybe the threat, the, the target we should look at in terms of survival when we're comparing it to cystectomy is the 83% rather than the 50% that's uh, shown in other studies. If you don't select your patients properly uh, with radiation therapy, they don't do well. This is based on population-based studies. If you look at the Toronto experience, they published their 10-year experience, 340 patients, and they're currently updating that recently. But 340 patients, disease-specific survival, 42%. Not, not, not so great. Initial experience at McGill, we weren't selecting them very well. We had a lot of patients with hydro, a lot of patients with, who didn't have maximum TRBT. The five-year disease-specific survival is not good, 38%. Updated cohort where we selected them with no hydro, completely visible TUR, no palpable mass, then your CRs approach better numbers, 83% and cancer specific survival of 69%. So patient selection is very important with regards to outcome of this approach. And this is prov provocative, but I would argue that there is a role for trimodality therapy even in patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. How often have you seen the patients, particularly their elderly, where they're failing high-risk bladder cancer, and all they're getting is salvage chemo, salvage intravesical therapy, repeat TUR. I would say there is a role to uh, attempt trimodality therapy in this patient population. This is being currently studied part of an RTOG trial, awaiting uh, results. But the concept is plausible. And if you look at cystectomies done in this patient population, 50% of those patient population will have upstage to T2 disease, which is essentially muscle invasive disease, which we know trimodality therapy has an effect. And if you look at what's been done in Canada in clinical T1 disease, 
we're waiting way too long. You know, half of them have non-organ confined disease, 20% had no positive disease. So a lot of those patients are effectively T2 or more that we think they're T1s from the get-go. What about quality of life after trimodality therapy? Well, the Erlangen experience, and I, I use this to counsel patients, 2% risk of salvage cystectomy due to a contracted bladder, and 3% severe frequency due to reduced bladder capacity. Now, if you look at the Harvard experience, the toxicity is a bit better. Grade 3 toxicity is 7%. And they, in, their, in their cohort, they did not find any, any salvage cystectomy due to a contracted bladder. Now, this is a physician-reported outcome, not patient-reported outcome in their series. So factors associated with favorable outcome in this modality is, one, low-volume disease, so no papillomas, mass, no hydronephrosis. If you're able to visibly remove all the tumor, better, better, better response rate, and patients who have no extensive CIS or diffuse multifocal disease tend to also do well. One thing you need to keep in mind is all the data is based on urothelial carcinoma histology. I personally recommend routinely a rebiopsy post trimodality therapy. I've been burned a couple times where the scar looks <coughs> nice and clean, but the tumor is growing underneath. Prompt salvage cystectomy for non-responders or recurrence is optimal. And again, proper patient selection is very important in this approach. So radiation to the bladder and pelvic nymph nodes is recommended. The standard is cisplatinum as a sensitizer, but you can use mitomycin 5-FU or gemcitabine if the patient is not platinum eligible. And the patient needs to know that the lifelong cystoscopic surveillance with prompt salvage stectomy for tumor per persistence or recurrence is uh, warranted in this approach. So some of the critics of our trimodality therapy, one, most series have short follow-up. New bladder is not advocated following salvage cystectomy. Patients so young, the risk of secondary malignancy may increase with time. And patients are highly selected, so it doesn't really represent the entire muscle invasive bladder <coughs> cancer population. What I would argue, in the patients in, uh, in their 80s, none of these apply, you know. You don't need a 10-year follow-up in someone in their 80s to look at the outcome. None of them pick a new bladder in general. Risk of secondary malignancy happens later on. So, it, it, so it, it's a context dependent. Someone who's young, these factors are very important. Someone who's quite old, maybe they're not as important. So, so suboptimal local control remains a problem since 25 to 30% of uh, patients will undergo a, radical, a salvage radical cystectomy post trimodality therapy. Toxicity, although low, can still be significant. So our lab have uh, developed an interest in kind of increasing radio sensitization, ways of uh, improving this, improving efficacy, and allowing for dose reduction to decrease toxicity. So what we've done is uh, we initially looked at uh, the mTOR pathway, showing that the mTOR pathway is quite active in bladder cancer, and pretty much all cell lines that are screened, they're sensitive to this uh, pathway. We've published the first report looking at the activity of this in vivo, showing remarkable uh, to, uh, shrinkage in tumors in patients undergoing um, Evrolimus versus a placebo. And this basically served the premises of uh, future work looking at interrogating this pathway in terms of radio sensitization. This is uh, in collaboration with the Hopkin group uh, that published on the relevance of the mTOR pathway in patients undergoing a radical stectomy. We've looked at that in high-risk disease and showed that it actually can be re clinically relevant various components of the uh, pathway. And you know, the TCGA did, did thus confirm the importance of this, this pathway. 72% of the cases do have a mutation or copy number alterations in the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway. If you examine radiation, radiation tend to induce uh, the PI3 kinase pathway. And uh, one of the hypotheses is potentially uh, that could be responsible for cell death escape and decreased sensitivity to radiation. So we evaluated that in several cell lines where we showed that same, same kind of phenomena where phospho AGT, the activation of this pathway, is increased uh, upon radiating the cells. And uh, we screened several cell lines with, to radiation and mTOR uh, inhibition. And what we noticed is uh, cells that are sensitive to mTOR inhibition not necessarily sensitive to radiation and vice versa. There's no correlation between the sensitivity between the two approaches. But when you add the two together, there's a clonogenic assay, it looks as an, ad an additive uh, effect uh, 
when you're in interrogating the mTOR uh, pathway in the context of radiation. The G1 and the G2 increases, the S phase decreases when you combine the two uh, treatment strategies together. And in vivo, there was uh, remarkable responses uh, when you combine the uh, Evrolimus with radiation. So we got excited about these results. We pitched <coughs> pitch a proposal to Novartis at that time <coughs> about a clinical trial, looking at phase one, phase two clinical trial, adding Evrolimus to trimodality therapy. Uh, to assess uh, toxicity and potential signals. So, unfortunately, this trial actually was closed early because of high toxicity. Ten patients recruited. Uh, toxicity was significant. But if you look at the patient population, uh, there seems to be signal there. Six out of the ten, so 60% CR, despite 40% uh, of the patient population having clinical T3B and more disease. Now we've shown that the, the drug hit its target in the bladder. And more recently, yeah, got. Can you speak to the toxicity? Was, was it the mTOR has its own toxicity? But was it enhanced by radiation, or did it preclude surgery? So these are so the, the the enrollment for this trial. The patients that are too sick for surgery or refuse surgery. So surgery was out of the question from the beginning. The toxicity, the mo the one that was significant, uh, the grade four is the pneumonitis. Now, as you know, mTOR does have a pneumonitis uh, side effect, but gemcitabine also can also cause pneumonitis. So there, there, there is a bit of overlapping toxicity between the two drugs. And maybe in hindsight, maybe gemcitabine was not the perfect uh, chemotherapy in this trial. But the reason we picked that, because this is a patient that is, one, too sick, or refuses, or non-platinum eligible. And in McGill, our, non, uh, our alternative regimen when, we, when they're not platinum eligible has been gemcitabine over the last few years. <clears throat> and recently, we've uh, we got interested in the HMGB1 uh, protein uh, for several reasons. HMGB1, uh, as you know, has several functions. One, it can function as DNA chaperone, and it's involved in DNA repair. It, uh, it's an autophagy regulator, and extracellularly, it can also uh, lead to immune, uh, <coughs> immune response. Uh, if you look at all these uh, steps, they're all kind of... Uh, uh, related and uh, uh, shown to potentially be a mechanism of the radio resistance. So what we did is we've screened some cell lines for HMGB1, and we looked at radio sensitivity of these cell lines depend, uh, depending on the expression of HMGB1. And we showed that you know cell lines such as the 253JP5, UMC5, UMC6, they actually um, have low HMGB1 and our high sensitivity to radiation compared to cell lines who have a higher expression of HMGB1. When you knock down HMGB1, these cell lines who are uh, resistant, they become sensitive. And vice versa, if you take the cell lines that are sensitive and you add HMGB1 extracellularly, they become resistance, resistant. If you look at DNA damage, you know, in patients that uh, have radiation where we interrogated the, the levels of HMG1, HMG1 is implicated in uh, the repair mechanism. So there's more DNA damage when the HMG1 is knocked down compared to uh, when it's not knocked down. And, you know, with regards to autophagy, autophagy is also uh, decreased when you knock down HMG1, and that's in part related to the interaction of HMG1 and Becklin 1. In vivo, interestingly, uh, again, knocking down HMB1 in the context of radiation uh, showed that the tumors were most sensitive uh, to radiation. And when we looked at HMB1 in the context of trimodality therapy, which is, which is what we practice on patients, uh, context of gemcitabine and radiation, it still sensitized uh, cells to uh, the combination. And in vivo, it still sensitized the cell cells to the combination of gemcitabine and radiation. So our results indicate that a decrease in HMG1 leads to better radiation response in bladder cancer. The role of HMG1 in DNA damage and autophagy uh, possibly suggest uh, that HMG1 may be a major player in radio resistance in uh, bladder cancer cells. We're currently trying to look at expression of HMG1 in patients undergoing trimodality therapy to see if that correlates with the uh, CR. I think identifying predictors of response is much needed for that uh, approach, trimodality therapy approach.
if you look at the most recent uh, data evaluating uh, the uh, three molecular subtypes of bladder cancer, showing that one of the subtypes uh, is extremely resistant to uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, it's, uh, it remains to be um, demonstrated if these subtypes also pan out for trimodality therapy. That we don't know at this present time. So in conclusion, chronological age should not be used to exclude patients from definitive therapy. Bladder preservation using trimodality therapy with prompt salvage cystectomy upon recurrence is a good option in selected patients and remain underutilized. Neagic chemotherapy requires further evaluation of patients treated with trimodality therapy. And we need to identify better predictors of response to trimodality therapy so we can channel the appropriate treatments to appropriate patients. And lastly, don't be the one the closest to treating the disease to be the last to appreciate and adopt this paradigm uh, shift with regards to uh, the bladder cancer therapy. I'd like to thank all the lab members who've been instrumental in, uh, in uh, at least the basic science translational findings and uh, all the collaborators in the slide. Thank you. <laughs>